Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Don O'Porter and Louis Theroux. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. My goodness me. I was asked if I wanted to do a session this year. I said maybe something with Louis. I thought it was going to be about 100 of us in a small room, and <laughs> we ended up here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Louis, did you watch that clip? I did, yeah. What's it like watching yourself? I thought it was quite funny, it's actually. quite funny. Yeah. You're quite good. I thought good. it was quite funny. It was a lot of weird weekend stuff, which is, it feels like a different me in some ways. Uh, but a sort of more guileless, uh, sort of lighter, maybe more incompetent, Louis, I think I've, as I've gone on, I've, I've lost some of my incompetence, and, and, and that's a bit of a problem. I'd like to get some of it back. But also very willing. <coughs> like yeah. you, you got straight in there. You, were, you, you didn't kind of shy away <coughs> from the nudity, the headbanging, no, no. the vocals. I'd like to think I'd still do that. I, I sort of think, like, who is that Wally? Like, just <laughs> literally waving his willy around. <laughs> with I don't know if abandoned. I saw that bit, yeah. um, but I must. Um, so, uh, we, I want to say that there's, if you want to ask questions throughout the session, I've got this incredibly modern device in front of me, and you can do it through the app. Um, so, we'll start at the beginning. Mm. Uh, were you much of a TV watcher before you got on TV? I mean, I think like everyone probably in the world, more or less. I watched a lot of TV, maybe too much. Uh, I, I grew up in South London, and we had... I still remember having a black and white TV, and it was, it was sort of in the... I was born in 1970, mid-70s, we got a colour TV, and that was, you know, hugely exciting. You just sort of watch everything that was on, just marvelling at the colours. And I used to like... I mean, if I'd listed the shows that I liked, that would basically... I, we'd be done. I'd be going for the next hour. Let's I go watched, for it. I watched I everything. It. If nothing else was on, I literally... You're too young to remember this. They'd have test cards when nothing was on of a, of a girl playing noughts and crosses, with a, a rag doll. Does anyone remember oh, that's that? That's vaguely familiar, yeah. And, and, and so you switch the TV on, and, there was, and you would sit and watch the test card. Or, or um, if it was uh, Open University, if you got up too early and you switched the TV on, the only thing on would be um, Open University, and it'd be some crazy professor with flares talking about complex mathematics. And you'd just sit down and go like, that's a bit boring. <laughs> but it's the only thing on. So the things I actually liked were Program. I mean, start Blue Peter when I was very little. Later on, prank shows, Beatles about, things like that. Things that aren't very fashionable now. I mean, I could just keep going and going. Um, we've got some clips of yes. some of your influences. We're going to look at those. We're going to have a look at those. Oh, I've got myself held on with a rope against the lightning conductor. <laughs> That deserves a round of applause. That deserves a round of applause. So that was John Noakes. So, I mean, and that stands the test of time on gripping television. That's one it? of the best pieces of television ever made, in my view. I mean, it's, it's why, why would he do that? And, you know, I don't know. I, I, I was reading up on John Noakes before, just this morning, because I knew he was showing the clip. So he was in his... When I saw it, I was like, oh, young man's, you know, up for anything, making his name in TV. He was 45 years old when wow. he did that. Like he was a middle-aged man, his knees were going. 
<laughs> and famously later he complained that he had no insurance, although the BBC denies that. But, but the idea, it's like a sketch, isn't it? It's like, it's, there's literally nothing connecting him. He's no. just dangling off the ladder. I mean, it's wild, but he's also managing to be quite funny at the same time. Yeah. And that delivery is, uh, you're obviously influenced by the delivery. Well, I, did, I, I never knowingly, I wouldn't want to give you the wrong idea that I saw that and thought, um, that's what I'm going to do. Right. Not that I've ever done anything that matches okay. that. But um, uh, it was more the case that l l later on, when I, w when I got I got into, so I got into I'm jumping ahead. When I got into right. TV, I thought back to things that I'd seen growing up that were, that were in some way, struck, that struck me in some way as sort of remarkable. And it's that sense of TV that's sort of pushing it to the extreme. And, and, and also, that it, 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 what comes off from me there is a sense of authenticity uh -huh. and, and the feeling, because you're immediately thinking about where the cameras are and the fact that in the wide shots, you're seeing the cameras. So it's in addition to the sense of the danger, there's the, sen the sense that you're getting a glimpse into how television is made. And I think what that gives you, that increases the power of it because you feel like this is completely real. Yeah. Um, so let's get back to you. Yes. Um, and your start. How did you meet Michael Moore? So uh, I got out of university in 91 and it was, I, I was a very directionless and sort of confused young man and didn't have any clue uh, as, you know, as to what I wanted to do with my life. I, I went to America. I was lucky enough to have a US passport through my dad. I worked in journalism for a year or so. And then while working at a magazine called Spy, um, the magazine sadly folded, it went bankrupt. And a couple of friends started to work for Michael Moore, director of Roger and Me. He'd just been given his own TV show. The BBC were giving him um, a third of the money and had said to him, it would be, Michael, it'd be great if you could hire a, a sort of a British correspondent. So my friends, who were all Americans, said to Michael, um, we know a British guy, and he's, he's kind of weird. I don't, know if, I don't know if they actually said that. I assume they did. I don't really know what they would have said. Like, he's kind of funny, and he's, he's clever, and he writes, and I don't know. He, he, you should check him out. Mm -hmm. he, he might be a good correspondent. So I sort of came in more or less under a you-must-have-one-British-guy sort of quota. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was an affirmative action hire of right. a sort. Which is kind the boxes. Of, it's kind of sad in a way. Um, and I think what he, I think what he saw in me was a sort of sense that I was so raw. You know, I'd never been on TV before, and he was offering me a position on a network show. And I think what he saw was that I was, there was something in my sort of lack of skills that would that that would I don't know work. I don't know mm. what he was thinking. Well, honestly. should we take a look at it because it's really really something. Okay. <laughs> well, here at TV Nation, we found a couple who started their own. The side entrances. Yes. They have to come back. I watched that clip on repeat and I was crying, laughing by the end of it. And what I love about it is it reminds me how funny you are yeah. and how you started off a lot more funny than you are now, I guess, on TV. <laughs> but, <laughs> but why the sudden shift into such serious subjects? Well, um, I think what happens, you know, I've been... That was in 1995, that, that clip. Uh, so I've been doing TV, uh, what is that, 25 years now. 
And um, I think what happens is you, you, you just get older and you get interested in other things or you, you, you if, I'm, if I'm completely honest, what happened was there was, a, there was a sort of growth that went on and at a certain point there was a fork in the road and I realized that um, we could keep making programs that were funny but less, somehow sort of less impactful and, and in, in, in my sense of things, less important, less gripping, less shocking. Um, or we could, do, we could say, <clears throat> do you know what? Maybe it doesn't have to be funny. And, um, and we can still tell the story. And that felt like a kind of dangerous and a risky way of, of going ahead. But it was, it was almost like there wasn't really a choice because the alternative to me was so unappealing. So, for example, and it was a little incremental step. So when we did a story about a brothel, I remember my exec producer at the time saying, yeah, brothel, it's not that funny, is it? And I said, um, <laughs> well, I don't know. I think there might be humor in there if the, if the contributors are cast in the right way. Anyway, we... We did it, that was in 2003, and it, well, it was funny in places, and then a few years went by and we did one about um, a prison, San Quentin prison, and, and someone said, well, it's not funny, is it? It's a bit ugh, grim. Mm. And I think my, my friend even s joked and said, oh, yeah, that's the kind of program Panorama should be making, like taking the piss out of me, like you, you've got so dry and boring right. that you should be doing Panorama. <coughs> anyway, we did it, and six million people watched that one, the San Quentin one. It was the highest rated, and it was, I, I think it's an amazing program. So, it, it, but, and it, it's kind of funny in parts, but e each time, each time I made a show and, and I, I worried less about it being funny, and then the show was still really good, I just thought, um, well, we can push further until they got so grim that people stopped watching. Um, <laughs> do you think you could revisit the old days of side entries and... I, I, you know, Gags. one of the reasons why making my Scientology movie was fun was because it felt like it revisited some of that old uh -huh. flavour and it had a bit of silliness in it and participation and, you know, UFOs and, and, and kind of me shouting at ashtrays and goofing off. And even more recently, we did a, a show uh, in the latest run of three called Altered States. It was about polyamory where I... I got sort of, I got a bit silly. I didn't strip off completely, but I went to a sensual eating party. Oh, and, yes, we saw. And, and, and it was a lot of, and, and that was, again, fun because it felt like a bit of a, so yeah, I think I've still got the skills to do a side Still got entry. it in you. So how do you decide? You know, that when... was speeded up yeah. when I did that. That was an effect. But I, I can't actually move to the side. You could experiment more. You could start that. down and just pop up. Yeah, the knees would go, though, I think. Yeah, or maybe they could just drop you into shot. <laughs> I'm up for anything. Up for anything these days. Um, I've, I've lost my train of thought there, imagining you um, with broken knees. So uh, let's, go, let's go back to Weird Weekends. OK. Because um, that was kind of your first big show. It was as, my own yeah. solo venture, and it came off the back of doing TV Nation. I'd done two, two years of TV Nation with Michael Moore, and I think by the end, well, what happened was uh, it, it didn't get renewed. And, so, uh, and then meanwhile, the BBC... Uh, slightly behind Michael Moore's back, had approached me and said, here, why don't you come and make a show on your own with it's us? Conniving. Which industry. I think Michael was a bit upset about. And in, in hindsight, I don't really know whether he, he was right or, or wrong to be upset, but evidently he was. He felt a bit as though I should have consulted with him. Is that a uh, friction that still exists? No, we, we dare did that beef. <laughs> Younger people understand what I'm talking about. I want that on a T-shirt. I deaded that beef. We deaded the beef, and um, <laughs> we're cool now. We're cool now. Um, should we watch a little clip from yes. Weird Weekends? Yes, did I actually set up Weird... So Weird Weekends was my attempt at a long-form kind of version of what I'd been doing at, um, at TV Nation, and, you know, as opposed to a sort of seven- or ten-minute segment, we, we've got a 50-minute programme to fill, and with that went a sense that, do you know what, this can't just be me goofing off. And, 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 and it, all, most of my TV Nation segments involve me making fun of people, more yeah. or less. And, and, and in, in Weird Weekends, I sort of said, you know what, we need to expand the emotional uh, palette a bit. And, and it can't just be me. We've got to actually have some other moods mm -hmm. in here and get to know people and like people. And, and so that was what we endeavoured to do. Let's take a look.
That looked that looked horrible for you. That was um, <laughs> that was uh, I don't really have the form of words to describe what that was. It was a very weird uh, situation, which at the same time. Apparently, it's business as, as usual at the power plant. Right. Like, I thought, like, oh, that was them tearing a strip off me. That was sort of just what they used to do generally. And the only, I suppose it's a bit weird, like, well, why would you do it to a visiting mm. journalist? But in a way, they were showing me a kind of respect, I like to think. It was. It looked, it looked really respectful. Because they said, what they're saying is, we can see that you're, you're up for this. We can yeah. see that we're not going to patronise you by saying, like, um, you know, you're a visiting presenter... Just do a few crunches and then and we'll say like, well, here's your Jim will fix it badge. Um, so you, uh, you are we'll probably that later. Yeah, let's get back into that. You're probably aware of um, Ruby Wax's comments on your friend yeah. Adam Buxton's podcast, yeah. uh, where I'm I, I'm just going to play, play the cliff actually. Cause okay. Oh gosh, I haven't heard this. Quote her. I did the hardcore stuff. I love Laugh because she's obviously quite pissed off with you. Um, so, uh, your reaction? Well, I haven't heard that before, but I'd heard about it, and I think I read a transcript of it. And I think, uh, you know, I, the, I think the first thing to say is that um, I was in America throughout the 90s, from, from about 91 to 98, at, at the time at which sort of Ruby Wax was on TV a lot, making many of the shows that she's best known for. As a result, I hadn't seen many of them, in fact, none of them until later on. All through TV Nation and, and Weird Weekends, I had no, um, no real knowledge mm -hmm. of anything she'd done on TV. And so, so it's, I, it is mistaken, the idea that I took uh, things from her, at least took very much from her. I, I would acknowledge that um, there was a certain amount, in, when I made the first celebrity profile, Jimmy Savile, it was it was sort of in the air, the idea that, oh, <clears throat> in some ways this is similar to what Ruby Wax does. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't seen, I don't think I'd seen, maybe I'd seen one or two of her profiles. And, and to me, as much of an influence would have been something like um, uh, Molly Deneen's profile of Jerry Halliwell, where she followed her for sort of uh, weeks, if not months, over the course of an hour and a half right. documentary. Or John Ronson's profile of um, the Tottenham Ayatollah. So he should be pissed off. Well, Ronson's got more of a right to be annoyed <laughs> than, than Ruby Wax. But I also feel as though people kind of resenting you uh, is kind of a compliment. You know, I'm not trying to be glib about it. I sort of feel like, it's, I, think, I think it's, what, I, I feel bad for her. I feel bad that she's upset by it. I can completely relate to the sense of um, having to be brought face to face with um, your sort of TV shelf life, mm -hmm. or, or and, and and the idea of being threatened by people who are m a bit younger um, is completely understandable. So and I feel, a man. And, I'm, and 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 at the same time, <laughs> and a man, and um, <clears throat> and at the same time, um, a little part of me is, I suppose, yeah, flat, flattered that she would be so annoyed. You know what I mean? Well, Does that make sense? Good attitude. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm not take taking a question. pleasure That's in the right. fact that she's upset. No, of course not. Yeah. Um, so, I have some questions here. Just give me a second. Um, 
How do you remain so calm and impartial when talking to people with some of the most extreme views, e.g. anti-LGBTQ, Nazis, prisoners, etc.? Yeah. Okay, so that may be the, most, the question I'm asked most often <coughs> in, this, in this kind of forum. And, and what, what I always have to say is, like, uh, to be honest with you, it, I, I, um, I try not to be as calm as I am. In other words, it takes more effort for me to, it doesn't take an effort to be calm. Like sometimes I have to make myself more confrontational. Right. I have a tendency to be a little bit <clears throat> sort of over, maybe laid back. And um, I think what happens is you go there and you're being told like you're going to meet some Nazis, right? And you're like, okay. <laughs> and and they're going to be wearing, or you know, you read your research like you're going to be come to the door wearing swastikas, they'll be skinheads. You're like, fine. So then you go to the and uh, you go to the door and like. I'm a goddamn Nazi, you motherfucker. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that's what my notes said. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not surprised. Yeah, I, 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 think, <coughs> I think you're a piece of shit. You come from the Jews media? You're like, well, I, that's not generally how I think of it, but you know what I mean? It's like, in other words, it's not like, well, you're what? You're a, you're a what? Like, yeah. you, you, it would be quite weird to be shocked. <laughs> I'd be more shocked if you came in the door and said like, I'm not a Nazi. I'd be like, what? You're not, Damn it! Like, have I come to the wrong house? Uh, I think the only time, the only time when it, I, I generally get riled up, is uh, sometimes when someone's attacking you personally or mischaracterizing you, and without meaning to. So, so when I did my Scientology movie, the Scientologists have a kind of gift for um, pushing your buttons. It's almost something that they train in. Mm -hmm. And famously, they made John Sweeney, the Panorama reporter, go shouty crackers when he was visiting a facility. But they kept interrupting him and going like, you're a bigot, John. John, you're a bigot. You're a bigot, John. No, I'm not a John. John, you're a bigot. John, you're a bigot. I'm not, I'm not a bigot. <laughs> and he went nuts. And, yeah. and that's the thing. They've got certain techniques. And so with me, there was like, you're trespassing. You need to leave. We're calling the cops. You're trespassing. I'm not, you're trespassing. You need to leave. We're you're tre and you think like, I'm not trespassing. Okay. Yeah. You just find yourself. So that's when I lose my cool. Right. We don't see it very often. No. Um, and we cut it out, generally. Yeah. <laughs> um, should we take a look at your Scientology movie? Sure, why not? I love seeing that side of you. I love seeing that side of you, that uh, kind of persistent cheeky chops that you turn into sometimes. Um, so uh, we can't be here today without discussing Jimmy Savile. Um, are you over talking about it? Um, well, I, I, I'm totally willing to talk about it in the sense that uh, it's something I think about a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I've got a book uh, coming out later this year and, and, I, and about seven chapters are about Jimmy okay. Savile. So it'd be a bit weird to not talk about it. Um, it's something that, uh, I, you know, in terms of my pr professional career, I would, I would count it as sort of the strangest and most upsetting event to have been in any way involved in. Well, you liked him, didn't you? You got I to know him quite, quite well. Like, I, yeah. I have to pick my words very carefully because sometimes you're like, well, you know, you were his friend. And, and I, I, never, I would never really call myself his friend in a straightforward way. I, 
we were, we were friendly. I have friendly feelings to, towards him. And I don't so much mean after... When, when we made the program... The program, I think, is a strong program. It doesn't really get repeated, you know, for obvious reasons. But I've watched it since, um, since everything came out. And it's still a hard-headed bit of journalism. My exec at the time, uh, Kevin Sutcliffe, had, had come from Panorama. And his attitude all through the process was like... We're gonna. We're absolutely gonna do a, a proper a sort of bit of journalism mm -hmm. about this guy. Like, like a lot of people, we we found, you know, at that time Jimmy Savile was viewed as sort of a slightly, by, certainly by younger people, as a sort of irritating old fart, really. Who was like oh, constantly going on about charity and not very funny and and kind of cavorting around with with royalty, and and um, so the idea was like let's get the you know, maybe slightly. Um, Calloway, Let, let's go on, let's see what we can find out about this guy. And, and um, while, you know, sort of slightly poking fun at him. Anyway, um, the program also shows him, we did, you know, some filming of him uh, after hours where he reveals himself to have uh, locked people up in the boiler room of his nightclub in Leeds and been questioned by the police about it. So there's, there's very revealing things in it. Afterwards, for about a year afterwards, he, because he sort of said he liked the program, he agreed to do publicity, and then we, I would still see him, I saw him maybe three or four times in Leeds afterwards to do bits of publicity, to launch a DVD, to film a little mini documentary. Funnily enough, the last time I was in Edinburgh in 2002, we made a mini documentary called When Jimmy Met Louis, in which he sort of turned the tables on me and we filmed him at my house, mm -hmm. going around and asking me questions. And he was always sort of, it, happy to be kind of in my orbit and I think saw me as a little bit of a, as a sort of piece of, um, as a way of staying relevant. Anyway, and, and, and it was during that time so I began to see him as, I suppose, a sort of a, a, in some way and defined as broadly as I can, sort of, in some way okay, like he's an okay guy. And if someone said to him, to me about him like, oh, he, he's a wrong one, isn't he? And I'd say like, um, well, I'm not really sure. Uh, let's watch a clip okay. because then we'll discuss that. I mean, it's so hard to watch. Mm. How, how did it feel for you personally to know that you'd... Because I feel like when I'm watching that clip of you and him in the car, I feel like there's a part of you that doesn't believe him. Mm. And maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, you're, you're, you're questioning him. And... Well, how... he, what he's saying doesn't make any sense. No. What, what, what you're seeing, I'm saying like, that doesn't. The weird thing about the, that first clip is that he's bringing up the idea that... Um, he says, to put salacious tabloid people off the hunt... And I'm like, well, where did that come from? Do you know what I mean? In other words, like, I would never have initiated a conversation in which I said, like, a lot of people uh, pass about around rumours that you may be a paedophile. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't have... It, there wasn't enough to go on to make that a legitimate topic of inquiry, in my view. But what happens instead is I say, well, why are you always saying, like, you hate children? 
it seems a really weird thing yeah. to say. He says, like, to put salacious tabloid people off the hunt. And then I say, what, are you talking about the whole rumours of you being a paedophile? He goes, like, oh, yeah. And, 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 and that was his, the, the, the kind of the, um, the hallmark of his offending was that he, he, would abs he, would, he was so weirdly brazen and his ability to kind of just sort of address it and, not, uh, and appear to be, and, and, and take a position and sort of, that seems completely bizarre. I'm, I'm like, well, that just seems complete, so implausible. It doesn't make any sense. He goes, well, it's worked a dream. And, and, and his ability to sort of not be wobbled by that. Yeah. So when he was questioned by the police, when victims came to see him or their parents or anyone confronted him, on those times over the sort of 40 or however many years of his offending, because there were, there were occasions on which people w did come and, and confront him, and he had that ability to just brazen it out. Um, I don't want to linger on Jimmy for too long, if that's okay, because I know I'm, it's, I feel like it's, it's defined you quite a lot in mm. that space of the way that you um, cope and deal and interview and your responses to people. But um, I would like to just refer to a tweet you did about Michael Jackson mm -hmm. that... Um, I've got two questions I want to ask you about okay. this. One is, did you feel an obligation to support... Uh, victims of abuse oh. after your Jimmy experience, which is why you kind of wrote quite a bold mm. tweet. I hope everyone can read that up there. But um, do you think that your experience with Jimmy kind of inspired that tweet a little bit? I think it was part of w what I felt I had a, in a strange sense, I suppose I felt I had a little bit of a responsibility, having had, you know, without seeking it out, a kind of education mm -hmm. in how grooming works and how abuse often takes place. And, I, and I, I feel one of the most upsetting things for me is, is when you re go through Twitter and you see the, the, the level of abuse directed at Dan Reed, the director mm. of um, Leaving Neverland, and, and, the, and the strange kind of obtuseness of how, pe how many people, I assume through ignorance, and also I think, by the way, through a kind of self-grooming, their, their inability to see that... Um, the, the, the process of recognizing yourself as a victim sometimes takes time. And so people will say, like, you're inconsistent, or Wade Robson wanted to choreograph a Michael Jackson tribute show mm -hmm. two years before he came out and said, I'm an, uh, I've been abused. Like, that doesn't make any sense. And you think, if you actually understood how mixed up we are as people and the way in which your circuits get scrambled, you'd see that that makes complete sense. And I think, you know, without going off too much about Finding, uh, leaving Neverland, I think w one of the extraordinary things about it was the way in which you saw uh, that grooming process and the fact that one of the kids, um, James Safechuck, appeared still to be so, somewhat in love with Michael yeah. Jackson. And so, yes, I thought, I'm going to take a... Because I, 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 I generally resist doing tweets that I, I know will be controversial or divisive, but I thought, on this one, I'm going to stick my head above the parapet and take a stand. Um, I'm going to take a question. Um, they've now disappeared, so I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, actually, on that, the other thing I wanted to ask you about that, you've got a very long-standing relationship with the BBC. Yes. Um, I have friends who work from the BBC who feel they really have to watch what they say publicly and they might get into trouble or that they, um, the BBC might not be happy about it. Do you ever feel that? I, I have to acknowledge the fact that the BBC's been very kind to me and, and that uh, over the 20 or 25 years I've worked at the BBC, there have been times when, you know, I've, I've been through six or seven different BBC Two channel controllers. Mm -hmm. I started with Michael Jackson, funnily enough. He actually, that's a very in-joke. It's a TV industry crowd, come on, guys. <laughs> the controller of BBC Two used to be called Michael Jackson. I, really? It's a fact, I yeah. And then um, six or seven controllers later, uh, it's Patrick Holland. And over the years, I've had little fallow spells I've been, there have been times when I was, especially towards the end of the, um, when Louis met era, when no, no celebrities would agree to be filmed with me. About a year went by when I didn't really make any programmes. Right. And um, I was under contract, so the BBC couldn't exactly fire me, but they were very, you know, I never felt as though they gave me too much of a hard time about it. So, so to answer your question, uh, I don't feel any huge need to be very careful. Like, in other words, I don't feel I have to choose my words. Do you know what I mean? I do, yes. I do. I'm going to take a question because I can <laughs> see them again now. Right. Um, oh, I'd like to know the answer to this. When you interview, what are your best tips and tricks? I think the best <clears throat> w one 
was something I picked up at TV Nation, and um, it's really to do with um, capturing as much as you can, mm -hmm. in the sense of, like, I mean, when I started, it was, just, I didn't know, this was the only way I knew how to work, so I didn't realize there was another way of working, but it was the idea that you arrive, you get out of the car, you, maybe you call the contributor and say, we're, we're here and we're filming, and they're like, oh, okay then, mm -hmm. and then you get out and the, 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 the DOP gets out, he's holding his camera, it's running, you step out, he films you getting out, you go to the door, you knock, the guy says, I'm still in my pajamas. <laughs> and you're like, okay, sorry about that, we'll, we'll knock again in a few minutes. He comes back, you go in, and then you just keep filming more or less everything that happens for the following three, four hours. So in other words, where, whereas I think for some TV makers that, and it's a valid way of working, uh -huh. it, there's a way where you say like, we're, we're gonna knock on the door like, Okay, we're just going to set up, and we'll be filming, you know, in about half an hour. In which, at which point, he's not in his pajamas. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You don't get those little unexpected bits of actuality. So it's that sense of opening the frame up, expanding the margins. You know, it goes back to John Noakes on his um, Nelson's columns, uh, you know, where you see the cameras. It's that sense of just getting a little bit more flavour of authenticity and 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 the. And the the moments at the margins, or the unexpected moments, are often the most revealing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you get nervous? In, in terms of like, I, I think there's this presumption that when someone is on t TV that they're confident in all situations. So for example, when you walk out here in front of 2,000 people, how do you feel in that situation compared to how you feel when you're about to you know, try and get the most out of a Nazi? But f <laughs> for me, getting the most out of a Nazi, uh, no, let's leave that there. Yeah. <laughs> I think for me, it's a, it, it, no, I don't really get nervous, although I, uh, on the day when we're, especially if we're starting a project and you're thinking like, is it going to work out mm -hmm. and, and, or is this contributor going to, you know, will we click? Um, th th there's a sort of sense of, well, you know, just a very mild sort of apprehension or, or sort of heightened feeling. But um, it's a very, you know, the, the more, the, the, very often the best material, and, and when you know a documentary is going well is when you, you just have no sense of occasion. Uh -huh. You know, you're just sort of slipping into the reality of what they're going through. You know, I have to remind myself sometimes that for the contributors, it's quite a big deal. Yeah. Because you can sort of forget that. I think I'd be more nervous if I was coming to film me. Do you know, does that make any kind of sense? If <laughs> someone, mode. If someone was coming to film me and I had to answer the door and go like, hi, come on in, uh, I want to tell you about my life. I think I would feel right. more nervous. Yeah, I, think my, I just my role feels very natural. I just arrive and kind of go with the flow. Um, can we watch a bit of By Reason of Insanity? Sure. Um, seeing you back in action. upsetting to watch mm. when you see a contributor who is unraveling in that way or saying these things on camera when you know that this isn't that they're going to be exposed to the world their mm. life is probably going to change after you've been on this and when you're seeing someone speak that way like what's going on inside of you for on, on a journalism level and also on a personal level well I met two or three Jesus Christs mm -hmm. <laughs> and I met a Barack Obama and I met a guy who was doing deep cover work for the CIA, all um, at that hospital. Mm -hmm. So you sort of, um, and, the, and the mistake I made when I met the Barack Obama, I don't know why, he caught me off guard. And I, and I, and I just said, no, you're not. 
you know, I don't know why. I, if I'd had any sense, and normally I would have had the sense to say, like, okay, and then change the subject, mm -hmm. because the idea is you don't, con you don't directly confront the, um, the delusion. You, you just sort of redirect. But I said, no, you're not. And he, he said, like, he said something like, mother fuck you, and, and, and he just got really upset and then and, 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 and wandered off. The th you know, the reality of mental illness is, is uh, can be very sad. And, um, and, uh, and at the same time, there's that, 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 there's that very kind of queasy, sort of surreal quality to it. And I think, um, I think it's, you know, in terms of making programs, it presents a real challenge because you have to, you have to, you have to weigh up the ability to kind of give consent, to have capacity to take part um, against uh, the fact that actually you don't want to be sort of ableist. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to say like, well, because you've got a history of mental illness, sorry, you can't ever be on TV. So it presents all sorts of challenges. But uh, what I do think is that um, it has the, if you make a program in the right way, it has the ability to be very affirmative, very sort of connecting, and, and that, that some of the loneliness that sometimes surrounds mental illness or the sense of stigma and the inability to talk openly about it can be alleviated. And also, there's, I feel like TV's changed a lot in the way that we approach it. There would have been a time when we would auto, like, we would be set up to laugh at it. Mm. And there's just so much more sensitivity towards it now. Like, you know, what she's saying is it could be seen as funny, but actually it's devastating at the same time. And I guess if you were still doing your old style of your kind of side entrances, mm. it wouldn't work in that scenario. I'm going to take another question. I tried a couple of side entrances for that scene, and <laughs> we cut them out. Right. Toby's just said in my ear that he starred one, but I don't see it. There you go. I just broke the fourth wall. Wasn't that fascinating? Toby, can you just tell me the question, please? I don't see it. <laughs> Who's Toby? Toby. <laughs> oh, I see it. Toby's in my ear. He's quite flirty, so it's a bit awkward. Um, in the era of fake... Thank you, Toby. Um, in... I've never used one of these before, can you tell? Um, in the era of fake news, where does your brand of journalism fit in, and how are you going to attempt to combat the public's distrust of journalism? So OK. You, so I think... Um... I think in the era, you know, it, well, it's really interesting how the term fake news has been weaponized. As I recall, it started out as a term that was used about sort of news stories that were c completely fictional or con constructed sometimes in Eastern Europe and places where some guy who's just trying to generate clicks would, make, would find a photo and make up a story mm -hmm. that would go, go with it, like Hillary Clinton eats fetuses for lunch. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they'd find a picture of like someone taking boxes off a lorry and... And, and, and it would be like, okay, and then that would get clicked on Facebook. And, and then Trump then adopted it and began using fake news as a term against the mainstream media. I think, I think, what it, I think there's a part of it that, is, it, that means that it makes, it makes outfits like the BBC, where there are protocols, standards and practices, there is a sort of, you know, it's take, the idea of being factual and responsible is taken very seriously. And I think that... That's very valuable in this era in which you can get clicks for just making up mm -hmm. a load of crap. Um, that being said, I'm yeah. going to add one little footnote, which is, but I also do see in this whole populist moment, uh, there's a certain part of it that I do like. Like, mm -hmm. in other words, I've always had enough of the sort of cha chaotic, slightly pyromaniac in me that I enjoy m maverick voices and I enjoy dissident voices. So I think there's elements of that like, I don't want to enthrone the mainstream as though we must all be more mainstream. You know, so th I think along with the nonsense and the dangerousness and the racism, there's, there's bits of it that are kind of useful and positive. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk some more about what you like. Um, who are you enjoying at the moment? Well, my TV... Professionally. Well, like my... <laughs> Just like on TV. <laughs> Should we watch a clip? <laughs> okay. Shall I answer the question? I do, please. I'm enjoying so many people. Yeah. And my wife is very understanding about it. We have a, our TV's been hijacked by our three children. Mm -hmm. it's in, and spe specifically the four year old who you know, yes. Walter. And he watches um, a family on YouTube. I don't even know their name, it's called Kid City. So I watch about an hour and a half of Kid City most days, and they just play video games and film themselves doing it. 
Did you say what am I watching or what am I enjoying? I was kind of wondering, like in in the in the like uh, documentary in the world of what I'm actually watching. Realm, it, not if necessarily. I, if it's, what when I get watching. my own moments to watch TV, I find myself. Nancy and I will either watch like the latest sort of big budget series, like um, most recently Chernobyl, oh, yeah. which was amazing, and start st sort of the, the big glossy, sometimes the big glossy um, sort of. Uh, series, mini-series, but then, uh, then for my own purposes, if I can get away with it, I, I'll be watching a really good documentary, like a, um, you know, The Jinx is one yeah. I always mention, or Making a Murderer, or more recent, or on, on the UK scene, there's so many brilliant documentary makers, and I think um, Sean McAllister is one, Ollie Lambert, um, th there's many, many sort of first-person doc makers who aren't always in, Paddy Wivel, who did a recent prison series on Channel 4, who aren't always in vision, but you have a sense of a perspective, and, 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 and it's that, again, it's that sense of being in worlds in which anything can happen, and um, th there's a sort of, you just feel like anything could get out of control at any minute. Um, let's watch a clip of Ollie Lambert. Okay. What did you enjoy? It's sort of the sense that we have it, I think, for all, because we're at a TV festival, right? Mm -hmm. And I think if we can celebrate something in the UK, it's, it's um, I mean, there's so many things, but in, in my line of work, it, what I get is the sense that, in, in terms of making documentaries and, and, and a certain style of intimate, first-person, unfussy, non-grandiose you know, documentary making, we really excel at. And we, there's brilliant documentaries that are made in America, HBO often makes great docs, but sometimes they have a slight sense of kind of fanfare and, and razzmatazz. And I sort of think that we've got these doc, doc makers who, who specialise in just being intimate and in a positive way, sort of small and forensic. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about your new indie. Mm. That, uh, why so long? Why did it take so long to have your own company? Well, I think I'm quite a creature of habit. Mm -hmm. You know, like I like to get the same lunch every day. What is it? Well, it varies. I mean, for a period of months. So, so, for, so at the moment, it's I, I go to pre, I go to Pret a Manger. My wife doesn't even know this. This is a secret. And they have a falafel wrap. Has anyone had the falafel wrap at Pret a Manger? Can we have a show of hands? I love Pret a Manger. It's kind of amazing. And every time you think like that's another chicken that didn't die. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Unless they're cooking it in chicken fat. But you know that I've, I live in America and I'm back for a few weeks at the moment. I was here for six months last year and every morning I would get the pret manger egg with beans and mushrooms at the bottom, little pot. <laughs> and they've stopped doing it. And it's really heartbreaking. Anyway, you back should to be at a fast food sorry, conference. Sorry. Just if anyone's from Pet. Really so that's what I'm, I have that and an orange juice. Lo lovely. And no crisps. Um, <laughs> is, is anyone back in your company? Unless they have the mixed root. Those aren't really crisps, are they? If it's, you know, the parsnips and turnips, that feels more healthy. Am I getting off track? I, I, could, I could sit here and talk about fruit pots all day. So the reason I didn't start or, or, uh, so m with my wife, Nancy, and uh, my collaborator, Aaron Fellows, we're starting a company, and uh, I think what happened was I just got, I just, you know, I like making programs. Uh -huh. Anything that's not about making programs, I find quite boring if I'm honest, like meetings with uh, executives, and no offence to any executives here, uh, but you know, anything that's not about going out and, and telling a story or cutting it or figuring it out, I, I'm, I'm, I'm less interested in. So, so I just sort of, 
thought, oh, I'm just going to keep making programs. And then there came a time when I sort of felt a little bit as though, uh, well, what I, I kept hearing, like, we're not the BBC anymore, we're studios. Mm -hmm. We're an indie, or we're like an indie. And then at that point, I thought, oh, well, because people would always say, why don't you start an indie? And then, it, and, and then it sort of turned out, oh, I guess I'm working for an indie. But it still felt like the BBC. And then I, that kind of became my nudge, I think. I thought, well, if I'm now working for basically a big indie, maybe that's the time for me to start my own indie. So where's the money coming from? Well, that's, that's under discussion, isn't it? We're, we're having meetings about that. Nancy, would you like to pop up on stage? <laughs> so that's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have a name? No. No name? We should Any that. ideas, do anybody? We? You could shout out names. Shout out ideas. Because we haven't had all audience participate. Just say anything. The Rue the Looking Glass. The Rue the Looking Glass. Oh, they like that. Whoa. Very good. He nailed Very it. Very good. Uh, I quite like looking. I'm trying not to have my name in it, but looking glass, and then it could be understood that the Rue was print that. <laughs> Um, well, you're going to have to size something pretty soon, yeah, aren't yeah. you? Um, and just, are you, what's the plan with the company? Like, who do you want to work with? Have you got your eye on any talent? I, can't, I, I wasn't really prepped for this part of the conversation. <laughs> I think we're going to make programmes that are in the vein of the sorts of things that I do, but not necessarily with me in it. So, in other words, like, we'll make my programmes, uh, first person documentaries in which I go to the extremes or find stories that have real intimacy and psychological depth. But then... Um, stories without me that cover similar terrain, like re re really well-made, mature, funny, quirky, observational documentaries. Yeah. Factual. And adverts. Wait, how exciting. <laughs> I mean, I have to mention um, the merchandise. Yeah. The Louis Theroux merchandise, which, I mean, I went into Urban Outfitters a few months ago. There's uh, notebooks with your... You know what? There's a clip. I'm going to show okay. you Okay. make any money from that? No, no. Do you know that Rihanna sued Topshop for millions for using an image of her face? This, she said that it duped her fans. I feel duped as a fan. I think, um, I wouldn't pretend it's never ever crossed my mind that I might be able to make money, but I've never uh, taken the step of uh, finding out. I, I, what I tell myself is that uh, it's funny and actually um, it's, it's a big joke. And, and, and people get pleasure out of it. And if there is someone out there making millions, then I would be slightly annoyed. But I don't think there is. I think it's just, it's, little, it's nice, appreciative people out there making their sort of fan art and, and selling yeah. it and just covering their costs. Okay. Well, um, we're, we're nearly done, know, but I wanted to present you with a gift. I got this one for you. Oh, Louis, right, yeah. Louis with tits. It's so confusing. I don't know who it offends, the ladies or you, but someone's definitely being offended. But um, there you go, Thank your you new so night much. shirt. Um, so, yeah, it should fit. I'm going to put it on. Um, and you will all have a gift underneath your seats, if you want to have a look. No. Are you um, serious? It's very exciting. You've all got your own Louis Theroux sticker. You can wear it with pride on your lapel. It's on. Louis with tits is on. This guy does this for a job. He takes male celebrities and puts boobs on them for his job. That's what he does. I think it's weird to wear yourself. Am I still on my... I mean, yeah, we're all right there. Yeah, to no, wear yeah. a, yourself... In a, when, when I was growing up and listened to music, I remember once seeing... I think it was a guy in the Buzzcocks or maybe The Clash, and he had a T-shirt with his own band on it. I remember thinking, like, no, that's not good. That's naff, yeah. isn't it? You don't wear your own band on your own T-shirt. I don't know. I think, I think this is a look. Um, we're done. Oh, Thank no. you very, very much. There's one thing I'd like to do before we end, and that is get an Oscar-style selfie with everyone holding up their stickers. Um, yeah, but I'm not going to see it. They have to lower the lights, don't they? Do they? Well, otherwise we're not going to see anyone. Here okay. we go. Okay. Here we Good. go. Hold up your stickers if you can. Is that right?
Good, take a few. There we go. Yeah. We got it. Got it. Thank, Thank you, you so to our sponsors, the BBC. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I really Thank appreciate you it. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you.